六。
is to explore firstly why we care about birds and why we watch them and, uh, and then secondly uh, to explore what we can do, what, what additional things we can do uh, when we watch birds, with, uh, what, how can we contribute to their conservation. And in some uh, respects, the sequence of my talk is sort of autobiographical. It sort of uh, follows how I started out with birds and the progression I've taken uh, in my thinking and my, my doing uh, things uh, till, until today. So, um, the first thing uh, that I think all of us would agree on is that the, the reason we're interested in birds, we go out and watch them, is simply that they're beautiful. They uh, they awe us with their, with their grace, it's a black eagle, and uh, we are just fascinated by, uh, by the different birds around. And so this is a really important motivation uh, for all of us certainly to get started. Um, and once we've gotten started, we start to explore a little more. We, uh, we read and we, we are told about all the uh, fascinating things that birds do, how they make a living, how they manage to survive through the world. Uh, how a harrier, for example, is able to spot and attack and, and catch uh, a mouse uh, in, in all this dry grass. Because if it doesn't, then it's going to die. There's various adaptations, various tricks on its sleep. We learn a little bit about, about the connections between birds and other forms of life. Uh, for example, uh, we've got here a, a minor a starling, which is uh, potentially pollinating, uh, bringing pollen from one flower to another. And so we realize that birds are part of a larger network as well. And of course, one uh, motivation for, for many of us, for all of us perhaps, uh, is that bird watching can be a wonderful social activity. We like to go out and spend time with our friends and share our wonderful sightings with each other. And this is in fact why perhaps we are all here uh, to date. Uh, there's also a subset of bird watchers who are motivated quite a bit by an element of competitiveness. We always would like to say that we were the first to see a particular species so that no one else, else has seen. Uh, and we are uh, good at identifying species. I'm, by the way, very bad at identifying species. Uh, <clears throat> and so this is a lovely cartoon by, uh, by uh, Rohan Chakrati, who writes this blog called Green Human. So, because of all these motivations, we try and spend as much uh, time as possible outside in nature, uh, looking at birds, looking at the habitat they're in, looking at the landscape, and looking at the associated, uh, associated species. Um, and of course, in their turn, birds are also watching us, and uh, they're probably looking at a photographer at the other end of that wire. And we also start learning about the diversity of species. Uh, and that diversity is vast and it's fascinating. And that also means that we have to do different things. Like if we uh, want to be able to separate different species, we have to learn how to identify them. <coughs> and we have to learn all kinds of esoteric names about different parts of birds. And even more esoteric names about very, very subtle shades of a different shade of color uh, that separate one species from another. But that's all part of the fun. <coughs> If we observe, start learning the behavior a little more closely, and this is the flower pecker, and uh, excuse the rule, the photograph, this flower pecker at the moment is excreting something very interesting, and that's the seed of a plant called Loranthus, which is a partial parasite which lives on top of other trees and takes advantage of the support that other trees give it. And there's a sequence of photographs actually that shows how this flower pecker defecates the seed out and how the seed remains stuck to the branch after, after the flower pecker is gone. <clears throat> so if we start to take an additional interest in, uh, in, in uh, what we're looking at and spend more time watching them, then we see all kinds of interesting things happen. Um, as Ashi said, one of the things that I got interested in along the way was uh, in, in biology of weavers, and the reason uh, for that is specifically that the males <coughs> build a very elaborate nest that looks like this. This is not a really, name, but this is the nest. And they spend a lot of time and effort and they spend a lot of skill in, uh, in building this nest. And there are various things that uh, intrigue me about this. And I, I, uh, I just give you one example uh, of uh, one of that, that uh, I studied about them. And that has to do with uh, when you look at a colony of nests, these nest birds are colonial, many of you know. You look at a colony of nests in a tree, you typically find all the nests on one side of the tree and not on the other side of the tree. Um, 
<coughs> and that's often because there's some water below and they're safer because of the water. But if there's no water around, they're still on one side of the tree. And it turns out that they're on the side of the tree, uh, at least in, in our part of the country here in Hyderabad, they're on the side away from the prevailing uh, southwest uh, monsoon wind. So they are towards the northeastern side of the tree. And people have observed this uh, uh, pattern very often before and they speculated that, oh, this must be because it's safer for the eggs and the chicks uh, if they are in a nest from, away from the wind than if they were right in the direction of the wind. And uh, this is quite interesting because I was taught uh, while, while doing my studies that that's a good explanation but that needs to be tested. How do we know it's true that you are actually safer on the other side of the tree? And so um, uh, what I did was I took a nest uh, like this, uh, I took a whole bunch of them, um, uh, uh, many nests like this, old nests where the chicks and eggs are already fledged and I put artificial eggs uh, in the nests and I put some nests on the wrong side of the tree uh, nest on the correct side of the tree. Uh, and of course one expects that if you put nest on the wrong side of the tree, which is toward the wind, then those eggs, the nest will get bounced down to the wind and the eggs should fall out. And that should happen more frequently than if they are on the right side of the tree, which is on the, on the, on the other side, the protected side. And in fact, that's what, uh, that's what happened yeah, in, in my experiment. So, you know, sometimes you get motivated to, to look at the phenomenon and then try and investigate it a little more deeply. Uh, and another example comes <coughs> from this phenomenon of brood parasitism, which is a very strange and wonderful thing. Uh, this this uh, word here is actually a young bird, it's a fledgling, it's just left a nest. And it is being fed, it's not eating this other bird, it's being fed by this bird. This is a little bird called a dunham uh, in Europe. And this is a parent bird which is feeding the cuckoo chick. Uh, and this is completely absurd. This happens because the cuckoos, as you know, many cuckoos are also awesome, and cuckoos lay their eggs in other birds' nests, so they don't have to take all the trouble of raising their own offspring. And of course, uh, I never appreciate how much trouble it is to raise their own offspring until I have my own. So I can sympathize with cuckoo that it wants to put its eggs in other, other birds' nests. Um, so the question is how do cuckoos uh, trick their hosts? How does the parent cuckoo of this bird? trick this bird, the dunnock, into uh, allowing it to keep um, these, uh, in, into allowing it to uh, put its eggs in its nest. And of course we don't have uh, dunnocks over here and, and uh, cuckoos are not very common. That's the duration cuckoo I should say. But what is common is the coil, the the coil and the crow. And you might know that uh, our beloved coil is also a brood parasite and never builds its own nest. It always lays its eggs in the nest of another species. And again, in our part of the country, that species is almost always a crow. So they specialize on laying eggs in crow nests. Um, and of course, that's quite mysterious because everybody knows that crows are very, very smart. So uh, something strange is going on here that the crows are able to uh, trick the crows in this way. And in fact, if you look at their eggs, uh, they're not very similar. So the, the light colored eggs here are crow, two crow eggs, and the dark colored eggs are two uh, coil eggs. And the chicks also look different. The uh, coil chick when it hatches has a dark skin and the crow chick when it hatches has pink skin. So they're quite different. Now, for a long time, uh, people had said that, oh, actually the coil uh, gets away with it because its eggs mimic the crow's eggs. Okay, so they look like the crow's eggs, so the crows can't tell the difference. And so the crows leave the eggs in the nest uh, because they don't make better. And when we started, when I started studying this, uh, uh, these birds, I said, well, this is completely absurd. I mean, they don't look at all alike. All right, they're speckled with some dark color, but they're a different size, they're you know, different color, uh, base color, and so on. Uh, but of course, we can say as much as we want. Um, what we really need to find out is what, what the crow thinks. Does the crow think that this is a different egg or not? Uh, <clears throat> and so what uh, we did, is a little experiment just like with the with the weaver birds, where you can make artificial eggs, and I'll show you some over here, and you can paint them either according to the crow egg color or according to the coil egg color. Um, and so the arrow is just in on the top left that those are crow eggs, and the bottom right they're coil eggs. And the arrow is pointing to the fake egg. The other eggs in the nest are all the real eggs. And the arrow is the egg that we made and painted, and we put that egg in the nest. 
And what's interesting is that if you put a crow egg, a crow looking egg in the nest, remember it's an artificial egg, uh, then the crows accept that egg but fine, they don't see any difference between your artificial egg and its own egg. Um, and that's, uh, that's good, we, we expect that because we painted it to look just like a crow egg. If we paint an egg a completely different color, suppose you paint it black, completely black, and put it in the nest with the crow eggs, then the crow immediately spots it and throws it out. But when we paint it like a uh, royal egg, then about half the time the crow recognizes it and throws it out, and half the time it doesn't recognize it and throw, throw it out. So what does that mean? That means that the, uh, the crow eggs are covered in such a way, they're not perfect mimics. So the, the, if they were perfect mimics, the crows would never throw them out. But they are imperfect mimics. That is, they're much better than an egg that's completely white or completely black, but they're not as good as uh, an egg that looks exactly like a crow. So um, they're almost there, but not not quite. So they're, they're imperfect mimics. They're halfway mimics, and so the, the actual the speculation from the video on was correct. And uh, crows they do mimic the process, but not perfectly. So this is really interesting, we can get into the details of animal behavior or bird behavior, why they're doing one thing rather than another, what all the interesting things they do. And that's what's inspired uh, me for a long time. But of course as you learn more about birds and if you read more about them and you observe your surroundings, uh, you realize that all is not well uh, with birds. And there are many species, uh, phenomenal species which are in danger, whose populations are declining, and uh, who we need to be worried about uh, if we don't want them to go extinct. Uh, <coughs> Siberian crane is a nice example, uh, uh, and the population of the Siberian crane that used to come to India uh, doesn't come anymore, so that particular behavior, that particular population is now extinct since uh, uh, the year 2001, uh, uh, and they used to come to Bharatpur, and earlier on uh, they used to come to, even some, uh, come to some other places in northern India, but they don't anymore. The species is not extinct, it's only the population that comes to our country uh, that's extinct. So this was a rare species to begin with, and that's disappeared from our country. Here's of course a species that's very dear to our hunt here in Andhra Pradesh, Germans Kursa, and Germans Kursa is found only in one particular spot uh, in, uh, in Karapa district in Andhra Pradesh. And the Germans Kursa again is an example of a species that was very rare to begin with, and the people feared it was extinct until it was rediscovered, and after it was rediscovered, there have been some studies on this. And there was lots of optimism about this species, and a sanctuary declared its name. Uh, but I'm sorry to say that this species now, the Germans Kursa, has not been detected either by sight or sound since 2008. So there's no confirmed recycling or uh, nobody has heard its call since 2008. So we don't really know whether it's extinct or not. But it's not only species that are rare to begin with that are in danger. Uh, it's also species that used to be very common. And of course the prime example of such a group of species is vultures. And uh, <coughs> I remember very well uh, uh, watching large numbers of uh, Egyptian vultures uh, with the Hawaiian in India, uh, where roughly where high tech city now is. And I don't think there's any left right now. And vultures, of course, uh, used to be numbered in the millions. There are some estimates, the estimates are very rough, but there are some estimates that go up to 40 or 80 million uh, as the uh, population of vultures uh, in India uh, up until the 80s. And uh, from the mid, uh, from the beginning of the 1990s, the vultures suffered a dramatic crash, uh, such that uh, today, <coughs> uh, for some of the species, there's only 0.1% of the original population left, so 99.9% uh, of the vulture populations have disappeared. And the rate of this decline from the early 90s to today is one of the fastest rates of decline of any species known. So what we used to completely ignore during our uh, birding visits, and we very reluctantly used to take them off our because we didn't particularly care about vultures. There were too many of them. There were the rats of the sky, uh, now pigeons are the rats of the sky. Vultures used to be those. Uh, we didn't care about them at all. <coughs> and in the short space of 10 years, 15 years, the vast majority of the vulture population has disappeared. Um, so this is uh, uh, an example, a caution, 
for why we should worry not only about species that are rare, but also species that are common, because they can disappear even without us knowing. Another good example, of course, is the uh, house sparrow, and uh, although they, we don't have the, the, the numbers uh, to put on the decline of house sparrows like we have for the vultures, a lot of people will agree uh, that house sparrows have, have uh, declined. So again, an example of a common species that has suffered uh, a fair bit of decline. So what can we do about all this? What can we do about um, uh, conservation issues where we are worried about bird species declining or going extinct? There are many things we can do and many things that, that, that we do here at this organization. We educate, we advocate, we protest, we litigate sometimes. Uh, we want to make people aware, we want to make decision makers aware. And, and all that uh, can and should be done. Um, but I, uh, in this talk, the rest of the talk, I'd like to focus on what we can do, uh, not what we can do as part of our bird watching. Because remember, we are, we're here because we love to watch birds. We love to be out of nature. We love, we, we like birds. We love their beauty. And as part of that activity, we can still do a lot, uh, separate from going out and doing other things like education and uh, advocacy and so on. So, what can we do as birders when we go out and, uh, uh, and, and do our birding? There are various uh, efforts globally uh, which attempt to collate the information that bird watchers have and collate them in such a way that they um, give information that's uh, useful for conservation. And I'll, I'll talk about some of these as we go along. Uh, and I've arranged them roughly, this is not really important to read, but I've arranged them. Uh, to efforts that require a, a lot of input um, and extra work by bird watchers and efforts that require very little extra um, work by, by bird watchers. So we'll start with some of the more complex programs uh, in North America and the UK called Breeding Bird Service. And these are quite amazing. So uh, you can't see this from the back, but each of these little lines, uh, so this is the country of the US, uh, and each of these little lines is a transect. It's a road, stretch of road along which uh, volunteers like, like all of us, bird watchers like all of us, sign up to survey those that stretch of road. And they drive in their cars and every five miles they stop and they survey the birds around and they drive another five miles and stop and survey the birds around. So each one of these is a transect that is covered by a bird watcher. Almost all of these are covered by, by volunteer bird watchers like all of us uh, every year. So many thousand such, such points. And it's done every year, you know, consistent at the same time over year, and it's done year to year. So this is, called, this is the North American Breeding Bird Survey. In Britain, they have something similar. Uh, these dots represent one by one kilometer squares. So they're one square kilometers uh, uh, patches where again volunteer bird watchers go and they count uh, the number of birds of different species that they see. There are about 4,000 of these that are counted every year. And think about uh, the UK is a tiny country. It's a very, very small country. There are 4,000 of these that are counted uh, uh, every year at the same time. And what's very interesting, I hope you can see this from the back, um, is that the information that comes from all of this wonderful effort that's put together is really, really interesting. So this is a map of the abundance of the house sparrow. <coughs> How many house sparrows we could see in different parts of the country of, of the US and, and Canada in this case. And the very dark colors indicate lots of sparrows, and the very light colors indicate no sparrows. Now, in the US, you might know uh, that house sparrows, the house sparrows we love and hold dear, are invasive. They were introduced into the US in the uh, 1800s, and they spread from where they were introduced in New York, and they spread all over the country. So, actually, in the US, people don't like house sparrows, so they, they like to kill them, they like to poison and kill them. Um, but be that as a thing, whether you want to protect them or whether you want to kill them, uh, you need to know where they are. And if you if you remember from your field guides, your bird field guides, all the field guides will do is they give you an outline. They say, okay, this is the region where house sparrows are found. But you don't know within that outline are there some places where there are lots of them and some places where there are very few and so on. And this information from the breeding <coughs> also tells you there are lots of sparrows in some areas, there are very few sparrows in other areas. Um, and not only can one do that, but we can also look at how the numbers have been changing. <coughs> so this is a different map. This shows you the change per year. And all you need to look here, uh, 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 take 
few of this is that the red areas of the sparrows are declining and the blue areas of the sparrows are increasing. So, if you wanted to save sparrows, then you'd be very worried about the areas where they're declining, the red areas, and you might want to put in some population measures over there. If you want to exterminate the sparrows, which is presumably what the Americans want to do, then you need to be very worried about the blue areas, and you want to put in some uh, removal or extermination measures over there. Uh, so this kind of very fine scale information comes from uh, reading words as a Now the sister survey in, in the UK <coughs> is similar. So this is a, we've talked about the Eurasian cuckoo before, and this is a map of the UK where again dark areas represent areas where there are lots of cuckoos, and the light areas where there are no cuckoos. And you can see for example around London, big gap, uh, I don't know if you can see from the back there, and there are other urban settlements, there are no cuckoos. And so again you get this very nice information about where cuckoos are found, not just where they are found and where they are not, but how many there are in different parts of the country. And here this is again a map of the change. So blue represents increase and red represents decrease. And you can see the cuckoo is declining pretty much uh, all throughout the UK. But there are still some places where it's doing quite well. And that's very interesting because if we know which places they are doing well, we can try and figure out what it is that might be causing their decline. So there's really very interesting conservation inf information that can come from this. So those are, those are pretty complicated surveys. There, uh, some central body says, you should go here, you should go there and survey the birds. And you have to do it in, you know, in a, in a st with strict protocols. But there are also more, sorry, going back, there are also much more informal bird counts, which you can do from wherever you want. <coughs> and even those need to very interesting information. For example, again, uh, from the US, these different lines represent how populations are changing of different kinds of birds over time from 1968 onwards. And you can see the wetland birds in the US, the ducks and waders and so on, are doing very well. They're actually increasing. There are more ducks and waders uh, today than they were in the 1960s and 70s in the, in the US. But the forest birds, the forest birds are staying pretty much stable but the arid and the desert birds and the grassland birds are declining. And so this again gives you some information about how to prioritize your conservation, where you should you uh, focus most of your conservation efforts. Um, you wouldn't know where to do that unless you had these kinds of, uh, this kind of information. And again, I want to remind you that almost all the information underlying this comes from the efforts of volunteer bird watchers. I'll just say uh, very briefly about the two efforts that I've been involved in, one called Migrant Watch that Ashish mentioned, which is not a conservation initiative, but still I think can yield some interesting information. So uh, as he said, uh, people across the country are encouraged to uh, contribute to the website when they first saw a species in the season and when they last saw it. And this is information over the five years of Migrant Watch for the Rosie Star about when it was first seen in different parts of the country. And what's very curious about the rosy starling is that it arrives quite early in the season, in uh, mid to end July, uh, in the northwest of the country, and then it comes down, the populations trickle down all the way to the south. But they take a long, long time. They take two to three months to come from here all the way down here. Um, and this is in contrast with some other species like barn swallows or, or sandpipers, where sometimes the first sightings in the country are actually down in Kerala or Tamil Nadu, the Tamil Nadu. So some birds seem to rocket right down the coast in a matter of a few days and the rosy star is all these lazy migrants that just comes on very, very, very slowly. Um, and this is something again, the information that's been put together based on what uh, volunteer birds and migrant watch have, have contributed. I'll skip over that. Um, another uh, project I was associated with is called Citizens Fire, which was run last year. And it was actually run by the, the Bombay National History Society, but we provided some, some, uh, some technical input in how to run it. And in this survey, some of you may have taken it. Uh, this is an online survey asking people uh, how many sparrows they see around their houses uh, today and whether they remember what they used to see in, in times past. And, and this, uh, this information was collated uh, across uh, 5,500 uh, people who came to the website all across the country and, and contributed this information. Um, and from that information, even though this is not uh, individuals going out and counting sparrows, but it's just a rough estimate of how many sparrows people see and how many they used to see, 
uh, there's some interesting uh, patterns. So, um, one can compare what people used to see before 2005 and what they see now after 2005. And the proportion of people or the proportion of locations where people used to see no sparrows in the past was relatively small. But now, the number of people reporting no sparrows has increased substantially. And exactly the opposite for the number of people reporting many sparrows, this is more than 30, more than 30 sparrows in a, in a location. In the past, people said they used to see, very often see more than 30 sparrows. And now, uh, after 2005, uh, they say, very few of them say they see many sparrows. Um, so, this is not actually very rigorous who is going out and counting sparrows, but it's actually the first indication that across the country there has been a change in the status of sparrows where people used to see lots of sparrows earlier and now they're more likely to see no sparrows in a particular location. And perhaps more interesting than that, we can look at what's happening today. So, we can compare the number of people reporting no sparrows in rural areas, in city outskirts, and city centers. So the number of places with no sparrows in rural areas is relatively small. But the number of people reporting no sparrows increases as we go from rural to outskirts to city center. Does that make sense? So that means there are fewer sparrows in city centers compared with uh, city outskirts and rural areas. And, and conversely, the number of people reporting lots of sparrows, which means more than 30 in this case, in rural areas is high, but the number of people reporting more than 30 in uh, other cities is very low. So, you might say there's nothing really new about this because it sort of gels with your uh, intuition about uh, the house sparrow populations. Um, but one thing, of course, we have to think, uh, remember all the time is that our intuition can mislead. So, it's very interesting to see that many people across the country are consistently reporting these kinds of patterns that there are more sparrows in rural areas than in city centers. And there are lots of other interesting results, for example, which I can't show here, but differences between cities. For example, Bombay and Delhi appear to have some very healthy populations of house sparrows. Hyderabad and uh, Bangalore and Chennai in particular have very, very low populations of house sparrows. So there's variation across the country as well uh, in the house sparrow population. Um, I want to spend just a short bit of time on uh, those casual surveys uh, where so wherever you go birding, you just record the number of species that you see and what utility that information can be put for. Uh, put to. Um, so I went to this website called eBird and I wanted to explore what it has had. So I, I came to the India and I just clicked on some location and what popped up was something that my I had uploaded on uh, for a birding outing on the 16th of of February this year. And it turned out he uploaded as part of this great backyard bird count which happened last last weekend. And this is a very interesting event where uh, about 160, 170 birders across the country over the course of four days did at least 15 minutes of birding and uploaded the list of birds that they saw onto this onto this website. So what's the big deal? Why, what's the importance of what's the outcome of doing this? Now, some of the things uh, on eBird, I should say that there's very little information from, from India, so some of these things have to be taken with a pinch of salt. These uh, figures here show a progression from January to December at the end. And the height of these bars tell you how many times the species was seen. Now, one of these uh, lines represents rosy starlings, and one of them represents brahmini starlings and uh, Brahmini minus, and I want somebody to guess which is the rosy starling and which is the Brahmini starling. The top line, bottom line, which is rosy and which is Brahmini. Top line would be the? Top line would be the Brahmini. Everybody agrees. So this is like a calendar, a bird calendar, which tells you how frequently a particular species is seen. And the top line is right, that's the Brahmini minor. The Brahmini minor is seen throughout the year, has been reported throughout the year uh, from India all the way through. <coughs> and the rosy starling is reported in the winter, but very likely or not at all in some of the months. So this shows you uh, the difference between a resident and a migrant, and of course you can also look at the difference between different migrants because they have different uh, uh, times of migration. Again, this is very poor data actually, it's based on very little information because most of the people who contribute to this site uh, foreign bird watchers to come and visit and then, and then put their list online. 
Now we can put this into a map context. I don't know if you can you can see this, but this is a map for Rosie Starling. And if you can you see the purple square at the back? Some squares are purple. Yeah. Some squares are purple and some squares are grey. Grey just means that somebody went to that site. Uh, purple means that the birds were there. The more deep the purple, the more uh, the more uh, species, uh, the more individuals, of, uh, more frequently rosy starlings are seen. So this is the winter, this is the, sorry, this is the summer season, which I'm showing you. In the summer season, you see there are very few to no rosy starlings in India. All of them are further north and west. And if you look at this in the winter season, <coughs> you see that pretty much the starlings have disappeared from over here and they're concentrated in this part and in India. So actually, it's interesting, the most, uh, almost the entire population, 80% or so of the population of rosy starlings, winters in India. Uh, and all this information you can find directly on the website. So there's lots of interesting things you can do uh, just by yourself uh, on, on these sites if they have the, the information that volunteer workers have uploaded. Uh, I, I want to give you an example of a young man here called Sara who uh, works and lives uh, in Nanaj uh, village, which is right next to the Great Indian Mustard Sanctuary outside Solapur. And uh, Saran has been keeping a daily bird list. So he just comes back at the end of the day, uh, his work takes him around the sanctuary, comes back at the end of the day, he's got a register, and he just ticks off whether or not he's seen uh, a particular species. So he keeps a daily bird attendance register. And, I, and he's done this over two and a half years. And I want to show you what interesting things can be done uh, with this information. So here are six migrants. I hope you can, you can see these. And the progression on, of this, this way goes from January to December. So 12 is in December and one isn't shown, that's January. So we're moving through time from left to right. And from bottom to top, we see how, what percentage of days was that species seen. So if it's very high, over here is 100%. So rosy starlings are seen in 100% of days in October. Does that make sense? If it's very low, it means rosy starlings are never seen in June. So these are all migrants, and you see that at some point of the year, the numbers of the, uh, always go down to zero. And the two different colors are the two different years, uh, and right now the two different years are 2010 and 2011. And you can see that some consistency. Look at the black red star. In both 10 and 2011, they are exactly the same pattern of migration. Uh, they disappear in February and they are gone until uh, October. And, uh, sorry, September. And then a uh, common stone chart shows a slightly different pattern. The migration is shifted a bit. And rosy star shows a similar pattern again, similar between the years and so on. So you can compare whether it's different from year to year and you can compare different species. And of course, these patterns don't stay static. From the West, we know from the US and, and the UK, Europe, we know that migration times are actually changing. As the climate changes, migration times are changing as well. And we have no way of assessing this in India because we simply don't have the information to be able to assess whether migration times are changing and what consequences that might be for, for conservation of these species. We can compare the migrants with the residents. And this is really interesting. So we've got red belted which is almost at 100% all through the year. So 100% of days, Saran has recorded red in Bulbul. House parrots are a little lower, maybe 80%, and, and fairly consistent. But look at bee eaters. Bee eaters disappear for three, uh, three months of the year from Nanaj. And then they come back. And we know that many so-called resident birds show local movements. But we don't really know where they go to when they disappear. We don't know where they come from when they reappear. Uh, and only if lots of sarans and lots of managers uh, have this data, because presumably when they go to zero over here, in some other place they must be going up, maybe to 100. Where is that other place? We don't know. So we don't know where the eaters are, the eaters are going to. And similarly with weavers over here, white footed bunyas, now for uh, silver bills. And, uh, but the patterns are very consistent from the eaters and these two, from year to year. 2010-2011, they show the same pattern. So something very consistent is going on. And Brahmini miners are an exception because they show a different pattern. So the uh, 2010 and 2011 are completely different from each other. So Brahmini miners appear to be very inconsistent from year to year. 
And these the loose descriptions we see in field guides about you know, erratic movements or locally minded, those loose descriptions cover up a great deal of really interesting detail, a very important detail if we are to understand these species and therefore conserve them. And so it's only with information like this um, will we be able to uh, get that understanding. So in the in, in the SAP, uh, many of you may know, I don't think many of you use these anymore, but we used to have these little ridiculous white foldable cards with the species names printed and we could tick off which species we saw. And those of us who were in the 80s and 90s, you know, they used to buy them and keep them and, and tick off our, our, our lists. And <clears throat> what's interesting is what we've looked at earlier is just comparing two, year, two years and comparing across the year. But you could compare from year to year. So from the 1980s to today, we could ask, are some species seen a lot less? which might indicate a problem, are some species seen a lot more, are other species, species seen approximately at the same level. So for example, the vultures, which used to be still very prevalent in the late 80s and early 90s, we should see them on almost all the lists. And then beginning in the 90s, they should drop. The proportion, the percentage of times you go up, we should see vultures less and less. And so we could look at something like this. What's the frequency with which we saw the species? Is that frequency increasing? Uh, from the uh, late 80s uh, to today, is the frequency decreasing or is it about the same? Now this is a completely hypothetical graph. Nobody has ever collected the data. And I believe um, that uh, people aren't as fanatic anymore as a team of their, their words on, on the tick list. But I think if we were to think about the example from, from Sarah and Nanich, the example from Ebert, and the other, other examples, I think it would be very, very valuable for all of us to take that little extra time to record our observations formally and then summarize them in a way that tells us something important. What is the status of words in Hyderabad? We can discuss this later, but I'm not sure whether anybody has the answer. Does anybody know whether crows are increasing or minors are decreasing or bulbuls or anything else? And that's um, an unfortunate position to be in after being in we're watching in Hyderabad for 25 or 30 years. We should be able to, if somebody asks us, we should be able to say that these species are increasing or decreasing. These habitats are particularly under threat or not under threat. Uh, some of these thoughts are directly inspired by my birding mentor, uh, Siraj Sahib. And Siraj Sahib was very clear his, his motivation for uh, bird watching was just the joy of being out there in the beauty of birds. And in fact, for a, a teenage boy, if, if, if you've been around teenage boys, teenage boys don't particularly like to show emotion, like, you know, they don't like to admit anything is beautiful, uh, perhaps uh, other than teenage girls. But um, Sinatra would always say, wow, oh, that's wonderful, that's beautiful. And he was really, really showed us that it was, it was okay and good to show our emotion about seeing something wonderful out in nature. But that was only one side. The other side was that he was very, very meticulous. He taught all his chevas, including me, to be very, very meticulous in recording notes and to, in, to making sure that one's pleasurable bird watching outside translated into something uh, larger than just that trip and those wonderful experiences. And so I think the, uh, his, his guidance and his example in particular um, has influenced the way that I've been thinking about it as well, and has influenced the direction that I've taken in my uh, professional life, um, which, as I say, roughly parallels the sequence uh, of this talk. So, what I would uh, exhort all of us uh, to do is to continue enjoying birds and continue going bird watching and as often as possible, and in as many different places as possible, but at the same time, also taking a little bit of extra effort and a little bit of extra time to record those observations in a systematic way so that we are better able to understand how bird populations are changing, whether they are changing in time and space, uh, so that we, we are better able to respond to the challenges of the new world which brings climate change, habitat change and land use change. Uh, and we only be able to respond effectively if all of us team together and think of it as our, our contribution and responsibility. Uh, to the natural world to be that little, to do that little bit of uh, extra work. Um, 
And with that, thank you very much. Uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to take Do we know of any correlation with the uh, uh, population in the federal decline or increase or whatever? Do you think you've guessed in the same? Kind of. Have you got it? Yeah, I got it. I don't think there's any. Uh, no, I, people have speculated a lot. Uh, I got an email from somebody who was very upset about humans because they were. But I, it's just a guess, I don't think anybody knows. Yeah. 